I'm uh, Walter Willett, and I'm chair of the Department of Nutrition at Harvard School of Public Health. There are a few things that are pretty simple to do and can actually make a really important difference in our long-term health and well-being. Uh, probably first is to make sure that we're not consuming calories uh, in the form of sugary beverages. That's uh, pretty clearly one of the worst possible things we can do. Soda, uh, things like uh, sports drinks as well, are uh, very problematic. They uh, increase our risk of overweight and obesity, diabetes, heart disease, gout, and, uh, and, and dental caries. Uh, the amounts we consume on average are really uh, pretty amazing. And uh, don't forget that uh, fruit juices actually have about the same amount of sugar as does a straight Coke. So it's fine to have a small glass once a day, but to consume more than that amount of sugary, uh, that amount of fruit juice is not a good idea. Beyond uh, keeping sugary beverages out of our diet, one of the most important changes we can make is to replace refined grains like white flour, uh, white pasta, white rice with the whole grain, high fiber versions of those foods. Uh, that makes a uh, big importance in our health and well-being because it cuts down on the surges of blood sugar that we get after refined starches. And also we get a lot more of the minerals and vitamins that are removed from those foods when we process them, when we uh, take out the fiber and turn them into refined grains. And don't forget, uh, potatoes really function metabolically like uh, refined starch, uh, or say uh, white, white bread or white, other white flour products. It's also good to think about our protein sources. It's pretty clear now that high consumption of red meat uh, is related to higher risk of heart disease, diabetes, and other long-term adverse health consequences. So replacing a good bit of the red meat, not, not necessarily all of it, with uh, chicken, poultry, nuts, legumes, will make an important difference in our long-term health and well-being. And by the way, it usually helps cut down on the food budget as well. For a long time, one of the most popular misconceptions about healthy eating was that healthfulness meant low fat. And that led to all kinds of reformulated food products that were lower in fat, but often very high in sugar and contained just as many calories. And it's now pretty clear that many of those high sugar, high refined starch products are actually worse than the original higher fat version before. And many people were giving up very healthy foods like nuts and salad dressing because they were higher in fat, whereas those types of fat actually are healthy. They reduce our risk of heart disease and diabetes at the same time, and also make our food more enjoyable. Uh, another common misconception is that uh, fruit juices are a form of fruit, uh, when in fact they, uh, they were a whole fruit at one point in time, but it's so easy to consume so much of fruit in the form of juice uh, that we overdo the amount of calories. They're just as laden with sugar as is a straight Coca-Cola, and they clearly have adverse effects on weight control and risk of diabetes. So if we're going to have fruit, it's definitely better to have it in a whole form. Uh, you know, chew up that apple rather than dumping down a, a, a glass of apple juice. Some people are motivated to and do want to have a healthier diet but find it hard to do in reality. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can do to stack the odds in our favor. First of all, if you're just going it alone and everybody around you is eating junk, it's really going to be hard to stay on a diet. I think the first thing to do is, of course, look around your family and make this a family effort to eat in a healthier way. Sometimes that needs a little uh, negotiation, uh, 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 but in general, uh, it's important to do this as a family effort. The work sites are tremendously important as well, and uh, not all work sites have healthy choices. Sometimes that means bringing your lunch uh, and maybe having some other people uh, work with friends at work, uh, bring the lunch together and eat together. Sometimes if you're uh, in the right place, you can get the food service to actually change their offerings and, and make them healthier. Uh, sometimes it may be learning about different ways of cooking, uh, go, taking classes uh, to know how to prepare healthy foods. Uh, there are uh, uh, courses, again, you can go to to learn about 
uh, not just the nutrition part of food, but the cultural part of food, uh, ways that make healthy eating more fun and more interesting. So um, this, there are lots of options, and the main point is uh, don't try to go it alone. This is too important and too challenging to, uh, for most people to do just on their own. Sometimes a busy lifestyle is an excuse for not eating well, uh, but clearly you can eat a healthy diet. Uh, sometimes, though, it does require a little bit of advanced planning. For example, uh, I, in the morning, usually have cooked whole grains, and sometimes there's not enough time in the morning to cook them, but you can cook them up the night before. In fact, you can cook all your whole grains for a whole week and keep them in the refrigerator and bring out what you want to eat on a daily basis. And then I add some nuts and fruit, dried fruit in the winter if there's not fresh fruit available. So there's all kinds of different combinations you can make out of that. And it really doesn't take uh, any more time than uh, preparing an unhealthy uh, breakfast. Uh, sometimes I uh, pack some of that and some other things together for lunch. Again, uh, it may take a few minutes. Uh, or you can make a very healthy lunch out of peanut butter uh, sandwich with whole grain. Uh, that just takes uh, a few minutes and probably not as long as you would wait uh, going through a food service or, or waiting in a restaurant. Uh, we've looked at this carefully and you actually can eat a very healthy diet on a low-cost budget. In general, that means you're probably going to be doing more of the food preparation yourself at home because we Americans spend a huge amount of, of money uh, on food where the major part of the cost is, the, uh, is eating out and the food preparation that goes into that. Uh, some of the high-cost items on, uh, uh, on a healthy budget can be uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, somehow the word fresh often gets in there, but fruits and vegetables don't always have to be fresh. Uh, frozen is very good, and sometimes those uh, cost less and are uh, even more convenient than, than the fresh versions. So eating foods that are in season, uh, locally available, can help keep the cost down, and that may mean you don't have uh, tomatoes in January, but you can have lots of other vegetables. They, they through certain sort of assume they should be available all year round, but uh, they don't have to be that way. There's other, other things to eat in a salad that uh, can be uh, consumed off-season. We've also found that uh, a lot of people spend quite a bit of money on, me on meat, and particularly red meat, which tends to be a bigger part of the budget, but replacing some of that with uh, beans, with nuts, uh, with poultry can actually uh, reduce the cost of a food budget and uh, be healthier at the same time. Again, many people spend quite a bit of money on sugary drinks and fruit juices, and those are products that we definitely don't need to be buying. Water is still the very best beverage, and that's free. Lots of interesting things are going on in nutrition today. Uh, one of the very uh, interesting areas of research is vitamin D, which has been neglected for a long time. We, we know uh, for many years that that does prevent rickets, and that's why we fortify milk with vitamin D. But what has become apparent is that almost every organ in the body has receptors for vitamin D, and low amounts of vitamin D circulating in the blood seem to be related to higher risks of uh, diseases in almost every organ. So uh, there's still a lot of research ongoing about what is the optimal amount of vitamin D, but for most people that is going to be mean taking a vitamin D supplement because there's no food that is uh, naturally very high in vitamin D. The whole area of uh, milk and dairy is also a very interesting research topic. Until fairly recently, we considered that uh, this was uh, mostly important for calcium and that we needed a lot of calcium to build healthy bones. But as the studies have come in, uh, they very consistently have shown that high milk consumption is not related to lower risk of fractures. That's the one thing that's pretty clear now. And even high milk consumption as an adolescent is not related to higher risk of fractures later in life. We do need some calcium for sure. It is essential, but uh, probably one or two servings of dairy a day provides an, enough for almost everybody throughout their life. Well, we're working on lots of things. In some ways, it's my job to help uh, connect the work that a lot of people in our department are doing. Uh, some of our work is on cancer 
And uh, one of the general areas that we're looking at is the effects of diet early in life during childhood uh, and how that relates to cancer risk later. We've known for a long time that many factors operating in childhood and early adult life are influential for cancer risk later in life. But most of the studies have started off when people are in, at midlife and later because that's where the cancer is being diagnosed. But that may not be where the origins of cancer actually lie. So we're just starting to get a good flow of data from uh, uh, information we collected about what people were eating during high school and with enough follow-up now to see how that relates to events later in life. And we are finding a different picture in many cases. We are finding that most people do change their diets quite a bit from uh, when they're in high school and by the time they're age 40 or 50. In fact, the correlation is those correlations between childhood diet and adult life are really quite weak. So that, that's probably what's make, what makes this interesting, that it, this is really different information that we're seeing now when we have information about a diet during high school. Of course, many different aspects of what we do influence our long-term health and well-being, but right at the top I would put three factors. Of course, not smoking, and for anyone who is still smoking, uh, stopping that is, the, in fact, by far the most important thing that someone can do from, uh, from uh, the standpoint of their own health. And then uh, physical activity is also extremely important. Most of us work at jobs these days that don't involve very much physical activity. In fact, they involve sitting most of the time. And we therefore need to consciously put some activity into our daily life. That doesn't necessarily mean going to a gym and working out there. It can mean walking or riding a bike to work. Uh, in fact, building physical activity into our daily activities is the best way to make sure that we actually get that, that, that it happens. And then third is, is diet, uh, which I, I like to look at this as a sort of two dimensions. One is the total amount of food, meaning the to total amount of calories we eat, and the other is the quality of the diet. And it is pretty clear that we are eating too many calories, but it's also pretty clear that the, the diets of the majority of Americans are very far off from what would be an optimal diet. And uh, third, we actually see that a higher quality diet can make it easier to control our calories. So part of the problem is that many people are eating very poor diet, er, very poor quality diets, very high in sugar, very high in refined starches, very ultra processed. And those foods actually tend to make us gain more weight. So the quality of the diet actually can uh, directly influence the total amount of calories that we eat. So putting uh, altogether, healthy diet quality, uh, weight control, uh, being physically active, and not smoking can prevent about 80% of heart attacks, 90% of diabetes, 70% of strokes, uh, many of the most important uh, cancers. Uh, the, the overall impact of these three factors on our well-being is enormous. The good news is that we have learned a lot about how our own actions can influence our long-term health and well-being. So the idea of taking charge of our health really is scientifically supported very well, and it's very powerful. Mm -hmm.